I, I don't think that was my intention. I didn't ask you what your intention was. I said it's clear that you adopted a course which was not full and frank with the Ombudsman. Yes. Colloquially, there was a commentary no one wanted to give her bad news. So by this letter, the agency is essentially asking that you come up with $64,000 um, in less than a month. This is a summary of week five of the Royal Commission into RoboDebt. If you haven't watched the previous episodes, then I recommend you start from week one. I'll link to that and all the other episodes in the description. The Royal Commission publishes these hearings on their website, and week five had about 30 hours of footage. I've cut that down to something that's easier to watch so that you can still hear the key evidence. So let's get into it. This is week five. This week we had some key focus areas. We'll hear about decisions made by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, or the AAT, in early 2017, which confirmed that RoboDebt was unlawful. We'll also hear about external legal advice that the government received in draft, but then never finalised, because that too confirmed RoboDebt to be unlawful. And there'll be more evidence about the efforts to mislead the Ombudsman during their investigation of the scheme. But first, we had a witness that was a robo-debt victim, and she was slugged with an outrageously high debt that turned her life upside down. Miss Gay, can you tell the Commission your full name, please? Rosemary Gayle Gay. Thank you. Um, you're 76 years of age, is that right? Correct. Um, I live on my own. I have two adult children. My daughter is here with me today. Um, my children are a constant support for me, and I rely on them heavily. Miss Gay, you're retired, aren't you? Correct. I retired in 2020 at the age of 74. Before she retired, this witness worked for a logistics company on a part-time basis. She was also entitled to a partial age pension. Despite reporting her income correctly, she still ended up receiving a robo-debt notice. The debt notice states that an amount payable of $64,998.17 um, is due. Um, do you recognise this document, Ms Gay? I certainly do. So by this letter, the agency is essentially asking that you come up with $64,000 um, in less than a month. Can you explain your reaction to receiving the letter? Um, turned my life upside down. It was just sheer terror. The witness kept telling Centrelink that they were wrong, and they kept incorrectly reassessing the debt. Let me get this right. Um, the debt had originally been in the amount of $64,998, correct? Correct. You subsequently requested a reassessment or a review of that debt, and as a result of the reassessment, being the first reassessment, the debt was reduced to $6,683.16, correct. correct? You then sought a second review of the debt, and by this um, 7 December 2016 letter, the agency is indicating to you that the debt had been reduced again as a result of the second reassessment to an amount of $120.33. Correct. Years later, she would receive another notice saying that her entire debt would be wiped. Miss Gay, can you, in broad terms, describe how your experience with robo-debt has affected you? Personally, it's had a huge effect on my emotional and mental well-being and did for some time following 2016. Um, it was a good 18 months before I could get over that um, and I don't think you ever do get over it and every time I tell my story in relation to I, A, joining the class action in 2020 and now lodging my submission here, you relive that whole trauma. Um, it was a trauma I never, ever want to experience again. Given the government couldn't protect its own people, volunteers started to get involved instead. Not My Debt 
is a website that became the go-to for thousands of Australians when they had nowhere else to turn. The next witness established that website. Ms Jackson, can you tell the Commission your full name, please? Lindsay Kate Jackson. You had a role in the establishment and operations um, of an organisation named Not My Debt, Not My Debt, rather. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Ms Jackson, in what year was Not My Debt established? December 2016. Thank you. In your statement, you describe a person who you refer to as Kay being a pseudonym. Um, she was also involved in the establishment and operations of Not My Debt, is that right? Yes. You also refer to a person named Miss Amy Patterson. Um, did she also have a role to play in establishing and operating Not My Debt? Yes. These three volunteers established and operated Not My Debt. The website explained what RoboDebt was, provided step-by-step -step instructions on how to challenge Centrelink and where to get legal advice, and also allowed people to share and read stories of other victims. Ms Jackson, how much of a commitment has your involvement in Not My Debt been to you in a personal sense? Particularly in the first year, it was I would say a full-time commitment, um, probably probably two years, and full-time whenever an event happened, like a Senate inquiry. I mean, hundreds of hours. Ms Jackson, this was a massive undertaking, correct? Yes. And you've described how this was an undertaking that you took on, um, not because it affected you personally, but because you felt that it was... Um, an important issue, is that right? Yes. And it's the case, isn't it, that you weren't paid for your work? Um, you've mentioned before that you weren't paid for this work. That's correct, isn't yes, it? Yes, not at all, no. Um, Commissioner, I have no further questions. Ms Jackson, thanks very much for your time, added to many hours' worth of time over the years. Uh, you're excused. Okay, thank, thank you. The next witness was another victim of robo-debt. And this evidence showed how Not My Debt helped people in practice. Mr A, can you tell the Commission your full name, please? Ricky Dayurag. I understand that you lived in a place named Chetwind for a period of time? Yes, I was there for approximately 20 years. Mr A, can you describe um, Chetwind to the Commission as, a, as, a, as an area? Uh, a remote settlement, it's our community, I guess. Um, there's no services there except the town hall and a public phone box. Um, it's majority bush blocks and farming. This witness would do seasonal and irregular work, things like truck driving and farming jobs. He had minimal income and struggled with expenses and for a period, accessed Centrelink payments. What would life have been like without your New Start um, payments? I wouldn't have survived. Despite carefully reporting his income to Centrelink, he still received a RoboDebt letter. As we did not hear from you, we have applied the employment dates and income from the ATO to your record. This has resulted in a debt of $5,254 and 53 cents. What was your reaction to becoming aware of the debt? It was a very big shock, especially the amount. Um, I pretty much knew that I couldn't have made any mistakes to that amount, anywhere near that amount. Mr Ake, what if any um, effect did the raising of the debt have on your mental health? Um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, it was hard to sleep, um, hard to concentrate on work. Always thinking about the debt and driving past the road I should have turned into. What about um, Didn't feel like eating much. Uh, didn't want to socialise, just didn't want contact with anybody. He had great difficulty contacting Centrelink or obtaining things like payslips and bank statements. 
and he soon received letters from debt collectors. You should be aware that the Department of Human Services may garnish you your wages, tax refunds or other assets and income, including bank account, or refer this matter to their solicitors for legal action. They may also issue a departure prohibition order, which will prevent you from travelling overseas. He was also receiving debt collector phone calls. Hi, am I speaking with Ricky? Yeah. Hi, Ricky. From ARL on behalf of the Department of Human Services. How are you? Good. That's good to hear. So, Ricky, the reason I'm getting in contact with you today is in relation to an outstanding balance um, you have owing to Centrelink. The amount outstanding is $5,437.96. Mm-hmm. It is overdue, which is why it was referred to us for collection by the Department of Human Services um, back in December last year. Are you able to pay that amount in full today so that I can nope. stop collections activity on your account? No, nope, not a hope. And I've been speaking to Centrelink about this. Luckily, he came across Not My Debt. Was it through Not My Debt that you became first became aware of the concept of a robo-debt? Yes. And the practice of income averaging? Yes. Yes. Mr Ake, I understand that you engaged in some private messaging conversations with um, who, a person you refer to as the an administrator of Not My Debt. And I won't ask you to identify that person mm-hmm. this time. Um, But is that right? Yes. You say, really, that the administrator um, advised you to do two things, uh, three things, sorry. Um, Firstly, that you ask Centrelink for a review of the debt by what's referred to as an ARO. Do you recall that? Yes. Secondly, that you ask Centrelink for the debt to be put on hold whilst that review took place. Yes. Recall that. And finally, that you asked Centrelink to provide what's referred to as an ADEX explaining the debt. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And did you follow the administrator's advice? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. Mr Ake, at one point in your statement, you describe how Not My Debt became, quote, a lifeline for you. Um, yes. And then you also say that it became the most important source of information that you had. Why do you say that? It was the only source of information that I could find without having to pay for a lawyer. And they pretty much were the only ones that understood it. In 2020, the debt was wiped and a refund was issued. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. It was just... So hard to, oh, I don't know, be yourself, like, make it withdrawn, uh, scared. Um, Probably one of the worst times of my life. Christopher Bira, who is representing Services Australia, gave evidence in week two. He returned to answer more questions from the Commission. One thing he was asked about was the release of personal information during robo In 2017, Centrelink and then Minister Alan Tudge ran a scare campaign, authorising the release of personal information to the media of people complaining about robo Are you aware of a practice previously engaged in by the Department of Human Services, for example, in 2017, where um, uh, the department might disclose publicly personal information of a social security recipient who has made a complaint in the media purportedly on the basis that it's necessary to correct the record in the public interest. I have uh, heard of that and I have seen evidence of it and uh, from a personal perspective I find that quite appalling. Is it a practice that the department continues to engage in? No. Um, Can you think of any reason why it would be in the public interest to deal with a complaint in the media from a social security recipient um, by publishing their personal information? 
I, I can't really think of any grounds for that. This foreshadows some incredible evidence that will come to light in the following weeks when we hear from Alan Tudge and his former media advisor. The next witness didn't appear publicly. The video was paused to keep her anonymous. There wasn't much new information in the transcript, other than the department not really knowing how to manage complaints properly in their systems. But it was good to hear from the next witness, Professor Terry Carney. He was a member of the AAT and is a social security law expert. The AAT was an independent body that heard appeals when people weren't happy with a debt review conducted by Centrelink. In 2017, Terry Carney made a number of decisions in robo-debt appeals that determined the scheme to be unlawful. This was one of the earliest warning signs that the government deliberately ignored. Could you tell the commission your full name, please? Oh my. Your full name, please. Oh, uh, Professor Terence Ross Carney, otherwise known as Terry. Thank you, Mr Carney. Um, and while we're running through personal matters, could you set out your qualifications and experience? Yes. Um, I've got a, a law degree um, and uh, uh, a qualification in criminology from the University of Melbourne and a PhD from Monash University. Um, your current roles? <laughs> uh, I'm an emeritus professor. I uh, quote unquote retired uh, uh, 10 years ago to focus upon uh, my research and uh, the things that uh, I like doing uh, uh, more than other parts of my old job. And your old job was what? Uh, professor of Law at the University of Sydney. And how long were you um, linked to the University of Sydney? Um, since 1991 at uh, Sydney and from 1971, the beginning of my academic career at Monash. Right. Um, you were a member of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for many years. Yes. Um, when did that commence? Sorry? When did that commence? Uh, it commenced in uh, 1976, as I recollect. <laughs> um, um, as I understand you, having specialised in social security and human services and social policy law from the outset of your career. Correct. And I understand that you have published extensively, including for a period of approximately 23 years uh, in respect of the 400-page practitioner guidance on social security law for Thomson Reuters. Correct. It was a, an initiative that uh, commenced when I was still at Monash uh, with my academic colleague, uh, then Associate Professor Peter Hanks. Right. In your capacity as an AAT member, um, you came to sit on appeals from authorised review officers in respect of what came to be publicly known as the robo-debt scheme. Correct. Correct. Uh, the first of those decisions, to your knowledge, was a decision delivered by you on 8 March 2017. Correct. The direction uh, that you nominated as the first was that no debt or debt component is able to be founded on extrapolations from Australian tax office records. Um, can I take you to paragraph 22 of the decision? Uh, you described uh, the issue which confronted you in this appeal in this way um, as uh, previously unprecedented. That is, you hadn't heard of it arising in other appeals within the AAT? No. And you hadn't experienced it yourself? No. Uh, you set out there um, the finding that Centrelink was unable to advance sufficiently convincing proofs of debt or debt amount, then no debt arises in law. In other words, he determined that using just averaged ATO information was not sufficient proof that a debt existed under the law. Instead of appealing his decisions, the government did something else to get rid of the threat he posed to the robo-debt program. You indicated very early in your evidence uh, that um, your time on the tribunal came to an end in 2017. Yes. Uh, I understand that the uh, term of uh, your appointment um, expired on or about the 30th of September 2017? Yes, correct. Um, did you seek reappointment? I did. You obviously weren't reappointed. <laughs> yes. Did that come as a surprise? So yeah, I was surprised uh, then uh, not to appear on, on the list. 
despite having around 40 years of experience as a tribunal member and being a legal expert in his field. The Liberal Party Attorney General at the time, George Brandis, terminated his appointment. This move ended up backfiring on the government. You see, Terry Carney's AAT decisions weren't publicly released at the time. It was only after his AAT appointment was terminated that he wrote journal articles exposing RoboDebt as unlawful, and that really stirred the pot within the departments. Miss Bundy, would you please tell the Commission your full name? Uh, Elizabeth Ann Bundy. Do you have any legal training? I do have a legal degree. Okay. And what's, when you say legal degree, do you mean a Bachelor of Laws? Bachelor of Laws. And I'm admitted to practice, but I do not hold a practising certificate. I see. For how long did you, or did you ever practise as a lawyer? Uh, I practised for approximately five years from 2005. And in what areas did you practise? Uh, administrative law, uh, commercial law, mainly. Between the 10th of February 2017 and the 30th of April 2017, were you the National Manager of Appeals in the Department of Human Services? Yes. This branch of the DHS was called Appeals, but it actually dealt with internal reviews of Centrelink decisions. These reviews were done by AROs, or Authorised Review Officers. You would need to first get an ARO to review a case before you could then go to the tribunal. And so to contextualise this, the AROs, or the Authorised Review Officers, they provided an internal review process, correct? Yes. And would that include decisions in relation to uh, the RoboDebt scheme? Yes. You would think the head of this branch, responsible for the people doing internal reviews, would have understood that debts were being created without actual evidence. But it doesn't seem like she turned her mind to this. Well, putting to one side principles of administrative law, you'd appreciate that an allegation of a debt in legal proceedings requires proof of the debt. You'd be aware of that as a uh, lawyer? It, it, uh, so a, a, a debt requires uh, the evidence to support the raising of the debt, yes. yes. The assumption was that the amounts identified in the ATO data had been earned in equal amounts per fortnight, correct? Uh, it was, yes, for the basis of calculating the payment due to the person in retrospect, yes. And what was the evidence relied upon to support that assumption? That the person had not contacted the agency and we had made outbound call attempts uh, to contact the people uh, so that they could advise if that assumption could be displaced. Is it your evidence that you regarded a failure by the recipient to respond to attempts to contact the agency as evidence that supported the assumption? Uh, I'm not sure if I turned my mind to that was evidence, but that was the process. The answer, Miss Bundy, is there was no evidence, was there? There was, no, in uh, hindsight, there, and based on the Solicitor General's advice, um, it was um, a flawed assumption. And I suggest to you, Miss Bundy, it would have been obvious to you the assumption was flawed as based on no evidence, even before the Solicitor General advice? No. Do you see the heading 2014 advice? Yes. Do you see what it says there? You have asked whether a de debt amount derived from annual smoothing or smoothing over a defined period of time is legally defensible. Yes. And the answer is, in our view, a debt amount derived from annual smoothing or smoothing over a defined period of time may not be derived consistently with the legislative framework. Yes. That's clear advice, isn't it, that smoothing, which is another way of referring to averaging, is unlawful? Uh, yes, that wasn't consistent with the legislative framework. Yes. Right. And so, uh, and you read this advice as well as the 2017 advice, which we've just... I, I, don't, I, I don't think I did read the advices. I think I read the covering email. I see. So wasn't it central and important to your role to actually read the legal advices on the question of averaging? 
uh, yes, I think people probably should read all legal advices. Why didn't you? Um, it was an extremely um, busy time. Uh, I had come into the role uh, on the 10th of February. Uh, there'd been a lot of work already done. Um, I had perhaps made the assumption that these things had effectively been resolved. I read the email that went to the Ombudsman uh, that said DSS had said this was consistent with the legislation. Um, and uh, that's all I can provide. This is a common theme. Highly paid public servants were apparently too busy to properly consider legality, so they just didn't bother. I will note that this witness was only in the role for a short period of time, and it seems she had received verbal advice from senior lawyers in the department that the robo debt process was legally sound. Thank you, Commissioner. Can you see me, Mr Barford, and hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. So can you tell the Commission your full name, please? Um, Anthony Valentine Barford. And your current occupation? I am a core officer or pastor with the Salvation Army. Mr Barford, you were employed in the Department of Social Services for a number of years? Yes. This witness worked alongside people we've heard from before, people like Mark Jones, and he reported into Catherine Dalton. That was the team within DSS that was consistently raising concerns with RoboDebt when it was first proposed. This evidence basically corroborated what we've already heard before. Um, no doubt uh, in your small team that proposal reflected a significant change to the way things were currently being done by DHS? Um, this, this was a proposal that, that um, in my personal opinion, yes. um, sought, sought to change the way things were done completely. Did it represent, in your opinion, a fundamental departure from the approach that had been taken from DHS in respect of uh, the idea investigation and uh, raising of debts? Well, social security law established how that was to be done and this proposal sought to change that. Thanks, Mr Brose. I'll take a seat. Uh, Mr Scott. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr Brazel, would you please tell the Commission your full name? Uh, Damien Patrick Brazel. Um, you are currently a partner at a Canberra-based law firm called Griffin Legal? That's correct. Um, do your areas of expertise include administrative law, government advisory and information and commercial law? That's correct. You were previously employed by the Department of Human Services, correct? Yes. And amongst those, your various roles there, they included uh, role of general counsel commercial law from the de from December 2015 to June 2016. You agree with that? Yes. And during that time, you reported to someone called Annette Mussolino. Uh, yes. And then thereafter, you took on a role of national manager general counsel acting for FOI and litigation for a period January 2017 to May 2017. Yes, correct. And who did you report to in that role? Uh, Annette Mussolino. Right. You will hear the name Annette Mussolino from plenty of witnesses. She was the chief counsel for DHS, in other words, the most senior lawyer in the department. We'll hear from her in the next episode, and I'm very interested in covering that because I remember seeing her justify Robodet in Parliament. Anyway, back to this witness, he was also a senior legal executive, and his team was responsible for litigation, including AAT appeals and the federal court. The witness was asked whether he understood the basics of RoboDebt's assumptions, especially the fact that averaged ATO information wasn't actually evidence of a debt. Watch how long it takes to get a simple acknowledgement of that fact. You were aware, were you not, that the assumption to which we've discussed, that is, that recipients had earned their income in equal amounts per fortnight under the robo-debt scheme was based on no evidence. 
Uh, not at that time, no. You weren't aware of that? Oh, sorry, no, I disagree with the proposition at that time. Right. There, okay. there was evidence uh, from uh, the ATO data matching process. I see. So just to be clear, your understanding at the time in 2017, early 2017, that the ATO data provided evidence to support an assumption that the recipients had earned income in equal amounts per fortnight. Is that right? I think, yeah, that, that is uh, my understanding of it, yes. So as I understand it, this process was applied where uh, the individual hadn't provided uh, information relevant to particular fortnight, such as pay slips or the like, and therefore, because that information wasn't available to a decision maker, uh, the averaging process was applied. But an absence of evidence is not going to provide evidence, is it? Uh, no, Commissioner. There's no magic presumption you can get out of the fact that the person hasn't responded, surely? Uh, no, there's not. And you would have been aware of that at the time, Mr Brazel, correct? Uh, yes. Well, can I ask you this, Mr Brazel? In the absence of any other evidence as to the amounts of income earned by a recipient over the course of a period under consideration, the ATO data couldn't provide an evidentiary basis for a conclusion that the amounts revealed in that data had been earned in equal amounts per fortnight, could it? Uh, not the ATO data, no. Thank you. And you were aware of that at the time? Uh, I believe I would have been, yes. Thank you. So very early on, this witness knew that RoboDebt was based on unlawful assumptions. On top of that, Terry Carney's AAT decisions made things even clearer. Do you recall uh, the effect of what this d decision said in relation to averaging? Uh, yes, and I reread it um, recently to remind myself, yes. And do you recall that it clearly states that calculating debts on the basis of averaging is unlawful? I believe, I'm not sure whether it says it's unlawful, but um, I believe uh, Professor Carney um, that it was inconsistent with the Social Security legislation. And if it's inconsistent with the Social Security legislation, it's unlawful, isn't it, Mr Brussel? Uh, yes. And that would have been clear to you when you became aware of this decision at the end of March 2017 at the latest? Uh, yes. And if the department was unsatisfied with those directions, uh, it could appeal the decision, couldn't it? Well, it could appeal the decision uh, full stop, yes. Yes, yes. including if it was <laughs> contrary to yeah, the Yes, including the directions. Yes. But if it didn't appeal the decision, it was bound to give effect to the directions, wasn't it? That's correct, yes. Legally bound, correct? Yes, yeah, that's right. During your time in that role, was there ever an occasion where your team was involved in an appeal from a Tier 1 AAT decision about the RoboDebt scheme? Uh, no, not that I can recall. The reason they didn't appeal was that initial AAT decisions weren't made public. But if they were appealed, they would then become publicly available. But it gets worse. Email from someone called Aaron Barrell to yourself, CCing Brian Sparks, dated the 28th of May 2017. Yes. And it says, Dear Damien, I attach the redacted AFAR. See that? Yes. Yes. What was an AFAR? Uh, that is... Advice for further administrative review. So the standard um, term to describe an advice on whether or not to appeal 
a tier one AAT decision. That's correct, yes. And that advice was typically, was invariably provided by members of your team at that time. Correct? That's correct. And do you accept that the AFAR that's, that appears to be attached to this email is the AFAR relating to the same decision that we've been discussing? Yes. So you would have seen the a AFAR? Yes. And reviewed it on or about this date? That is the 28th of March, 2017? Correct. Okay. You can see the checkbox. The matter does not involve an error of law or manifest error of fact. Is checked. Yep. And you accept that uh, the person providing uh, this AFAR, Mr. Barrell, has concluded that there was no error of law in the decision that we've been discussing? Yes. And therefore, he agreed with the conclusions reached, conclusions of law reached in the decision of Mr. Carney that we've been discussing, correct? Uh, yes. Including that calculating social and security entitlement based on averaging is unlawful. Uh, yes, and yes, sorry. This legal team in DHS came to the view in early 2017 that RoboDebt was unlawful, and yet the scheme continued for years. We now move on to more evidence about how the Commonwealth Ombudsman was misled. Remember from previous videos that the Ombudsman started an investigation in 2017, and their report concluded that there was no issues of legality. They stuffed up big time, but that was partly because they were being fed misleading information by the departments involved. An example of this is the DSS response to information requests from the Ombudsman. Remember that as early as 2014, DSS had internal advice saying that RoboDebt was unlawful. But once the Ombudsman started investigating in 2017, DSS magically generated more internal advice which was vague enough for them to use to justify the scheme. This is referred to as the 2017 advice. These two pieces of advice were contradictory and many senior people within the department only wanted to provide the favorable 2017 advice to the Ombudsman, ignoring the earlier and more critical 2014 advice. We'll get to those senior people, but first, it was the next witness that made it clear that both pieces of advice should be provided to the Ombudsman he headed up a DSS legal team. Mr Grinzel jones could you tell the Commission your full name, please? It's Alan Reginald Grinzel jones You indicate that you were a branch manager of the Legal Services Branch Executive from 1 November 2016 to 3 June 2018. As a branch manager, did you have responsibility for overseeing a substantial number of lawyers within DSS? Yes, I think by my head count there were 35, but there were at least 30 at that stage. Your view was that both advices ought to be supplied to the Ombudsman in response to the Ombudsman's request? My advice that the Ombudsman's request was clear. They were seeking advice as on the Pacific Debt Matching Scheme and uh, both advices were clearly in scope, in my view. Yes. But it wasn't that simple. Senior people at DSS still did what they wanted and provided just the 2017 advice to the Ombudsman. We'll get to that in more detail with the next few witnesses. Mr Herman, can you tell the Commission your full name, please? Robert Alexander Herman. Uh, Mr Herman, in January 2016, you were employed in the Department of Social Services. Uh, are you, do you mean 2017? Sorry, 2017, I do. Uh, yes, I was. And you became aware on... Um, about the 11th of January 2017 uh, that uh, the Ombudsman uh, had commenced its own motion investigation into the online compliance intervention program carried out by the Department of Human Services. Yes. I think I need to give some context here. This witness was in the wider team led by Serena Wilson, a Deputy Secretary at DSS. We heard from her in week two. This witness was involved in the DSS response to the Ombudsman investigation. 
the Ombudsman's report included formal responses from the various departments, and the DSS response, signed by then Secretary Finn Pratt, made a number of false claims that sought to downplay the concerns around RoboDebt. You were ultimately involved in uh, the drafting of the letter from Mr Pratt to the Ombudsman in respect of the draft report of the Ombudsman? Yes. You will recall, and you can observe from the document in front of you, uh, that Mr Pratt's letter dated 4 April 2017 in the third paragraph said this, the department is satisfied the system is operating in line with legislative requirements and there have been no changes to the way DHS assesses PAYG employment income. In respect of the first proposition uh, that the department was satisfied the system was operating in line with legislative requirements, um, you were aware of an advice from Ms Pulford in late 2014 to the contrary? Uh, I'm aware of the 2014 advice I think you're referring to. Yes. Yep. Which is not that the system would operate in line with legislative requirements, is it? Um, no. No, it's, it's precisely the opposite of that, isn't it? Uh, there was subsequent advice. Uh, I'm talking about the 2014 advice. It was precisely the contrary of what was represented in that first sentence. Um, yes. All right. You could have written any number of things which you acknowledged about a draft report, but this paragraph deals with an assertion that the scheme complies with legislative requirements, an assertion that it does not involve the way in which DHS assesses PAYG income, and the specific noting that the system accurately identifies and raises debts. There is a clear purpose to this paragraph, isn't there, Mr Herman? What's that? It projects a defence of the scheme which was untrue in each respect. Um, I, I accept that it is a defensive uh, sentence, yes. A defensive paragraph? Yes. And in each respect, the defence was factually untrue or legally untrue so far as it related to legislative requirements? Um, yes. Right. Was any pressure placed upon you by anyone in the department to make uh, untrue representations to the Ombudsman under the hand of Secretary Finn Pratt, AOPSM? No, not that I recall, no. You did this of your own volition? Uh, I, I'm sure I would have drafted it or asked someone to draft it, yes. And I cleared it and accept responsibility for it. And you say that there was no pressure on you within the department to write a defensive response? Um, no. Then why would you do it? Uh, I, I don't know, I thought it was a fairly standard kind of letter to write in the circumstances um, to acknowledge the more positive aspects of the report. Um. We were talking earlier about how DSS Legal said that both the 2014 and 2017 advice should be provided to the Ombudsman, but in the end only the 2017 more favourable advice was provided. You can see that on later that same day, uh, the message from the P&I coordination team at DSS sent to the Ombudsman um, a revised covering statement um, and only the uh, 2017 advice. Yeah, I can see that, yep. And so when you rece received that email and were copied into that email that afternoon, you appreciated uh, that someone in DSS had changed the draft developed by you and Mr De Berg based on the legal advice from the legal department through Ms Pulford that both had to be provided, correct? I must have, yes. You must have? Yep. That would have been a significant thing given your conclusion that only one part of the picture was being sent to the Ombudsman. Um, yeah, I, I don't recall um, that day, but I must have concluded if I wasn't told in some other um, way that someone had decided to only provide the 2017 advice, yes. 
uh, well, I was responsible and I guess everyone above me also was responsible. What are you getting at here, Mr Herman? That, I mean, just that we operate in a hierarchy and um, while I have responsibility, um, all of my responsibilities also are the people above me also are responsible. What are, you so, what are you trying to say? Who changed it? Well, I understand that Serena Wilson made a decision to change it, or the Deputy Secretary, based on another email that I think is part of my evidence. Um, and yes, she sort of is higher in the chain than me within DSS. You appreciated when you realised that Ms Wilson had changed the position from the department and provided only the 2017 advice, or given a direction to only provide the 2017 advice to the Ombudsman, that that created a potentially misleading position of the department? Uh, yes, yes. Point. Well, it's clear from the documents that you adopted a course where you were not full and frank with the Ombudsman, correct? I, I don't think that was my intention. I didn't ask you what your intention was. I said it's clear that you adopted a course which was not full and frank with the Ombudsman. Yes. Right. I suggest to you that there was a pattern of behaviour from the start in January 2017 by people within DSS of which you were part. And it was designed to establish the lawfulness of the scheme in the representations that it made to the Ombudsman, irrespective of the true position. Uh, I think we were, I think it was, we tried to put it in a positive light, I guess. Um, yes, but it's a bit hard to put a positive light on something that you understood was being conducted unlawfully according to the advice that had been given in 2014 for a period of 18 months and was unfair according to your view. What I'm suggesting to you, Mr Herman, is that you well understood from the Deputy Secretary level of Ms Serena Wilson down to Ms Halbert, to Mr De Berg, to yourself, that there was a concerted effort to respond to the Ombudsman's investigation by asserting both lawfulness and accuracy of debts raised under the OCI scheme. Um, I think, yes, we were providing the... The intention was to provide the advice that, um, or to emphasise the 2017 advice that it was lawful, yes. And accurate? Yes. And that there'd been no change to the system? Yes. Can you tell the Commission your full name, please? Sorry? Your full name, please. Russell Ian de Berg. You were involved, um, amongst other things, um, in the DSS response to the Ombudsman's own motion investigation in early 2017. Yes. In terms of the hierarchy of your role, um, uh, Mr Herman was below you or reported to you? Yes. Uh, and you reported to Ms Kath Halbert, who was a group manager? Yes. And Ms Kath Halbert reported to Ms Wilson, who was a deputy secretary? Correct. Right. At this time, you were a very senior person within DSS. You held an SES appointment? Yes. Level one? Yes. All right. Um, and you understood, of course, that it was very important not to mislead the Ombudsman by any of the responses that DSS gave uh, to the Ombudsman's questions? Yes. Not only was it important from a departmental perspective, but um, you had personally obligations under the APS Code of Conduct which would have precluded, or ought to have precluded, any misleading statements being made to the Ombudsman? Yes. All right. This witness oversaw the team that was responsible for the dealings with the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman had come back to DSS a number of times, requesting any additional documents. What's now clear is that there were more documents that should have been provided to the Ombudsman, but no one bothered to find and provide these documents. You see, Mr. De Berg, it's not just that they weren't provided as the, what I've described as the third occasion in the sequence. 
It's the fact that they were known to exist two days before the response was due and no action was taken to search for them. That suggests a deliberate choice, doesn't it, by those considering the response to the Ombudsman? Okay, I, I accept, yeah, yes. All right. This next witness was a lawyer, initially at DHS, before she moved across to DSS. Um, Ms Fredericks, could you please inform the Commission your full name? Uh, Anna Jane Fredericks. In 2017, this witness and other DHS lawyers attended a conference on administrative law. Are you aware of the Australian Institute of Administrative Lawyers? I am. Do you recall attending the Institute's conference in July 2017? I do. Do you recall um, a number of other Department of Human Services lawyers attended? Yes. Do you recall Mr Hanks presented a paper? I do. Um, but you're aware of who Mr Hanks is, don't, aren't you? I am, yes. He's now a King's Counsel by by default, but at the time, of course, he was a Queen's Counsel. Yes, correct. A leading public administrative law, public lawyer in Australia, correct? Correct. As Peter Hanks made his presentation criticising RoboDebt, this witness's manager, Maris Steepnicks, was also at the conference, and he was providing executives with live updates. We call out the email at the bottom of the page, 20 July 2017, 5.22 p.m. from Mr Steepnicks. It says, Peter Hanks QC's main lecture has commenced and an introductory remark suggests it will be quite critical of the department's actions re-OCI. See that? I do. Okay, if we call out the next email on the chain. The later email from Mr Steepnick saying the main thrust is a suggestion that raising of debts using averaging is not consistent with the terms of the social security law. Further, that the law provides no scope to put the onus on the customer to provide information that they do not owe of debt. See that? See, that's an email from Mr Steepnicks at a later time, 6.02pm, stating these words, critical of Ombudsman's report for not questioning whether the process was consistent with the social security law. Yes. Ended by suggesting that someone should look to test the matter in the federal court. Do you see that? I do. All right. Did what Mr Hanks say at the conference raise any concerns for you about the lawfulness of the Robodet scheme? Yes. Um, given who had made the presentation and the nature of the criticisms as to its lawfulness, it would have revealed to you, wouldn't it, that the Commonwealth faced very significant legal exposure and risk, correct? Correct. And that the sensible course at that stage, on any view, would be to get an independent legal opinion as to its lawfulness, correct? That would be my recommendation, yes. For OCI at the time, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been possible within the department for um, an EL1 or an EL2 lawyer such as myself to independently and autonomously go out and outsource advice on the legality of the RoboDebt program. That would have had to have been approved at a much higher level. How high? Um, I would say at least, it would have at least gone, my understanding would have at least gone to Annette Mussolino, I'm certain Annette would have probably talked with Melissa Golightly, who was the program DEPSEC at the time, um, and Melissa would have spoken with Catherine Campbell, and if, Kath, if either of those parties had not been supportive, we would have been told very clearly, or instructed not to seek advice. And Catherine Campbell didn't seem like the type of person to want external advice that could prove her wrong. My observation that she, that secretary could be quite uh, controlling, um, had particular views that, and was not particularly keen or interested to hear views that did not support those views, her views, um, and there came to be a culture of, even at the higher levels of reticence or fear to raise issues or no one, 
Colloquially, there was a commentary no one wanted to give her bad news. I want to show you one final snippet from this witness, and it deals with external legal advice that was finally asked for in 2018. This witness had recommended they seek advice from law firm Clayton Utes. We saw evidence about this in week one, about how this advice was provided in draft, but never finalised. The advice clearly said RoboDebt was unlawful. Um, yes, you accept that there was, a, from that, a recommendation by you to get advice from Clayton Utes? Yes, correct. And that recommendation was accepted? Correct. And the advice was sought? Yes. It was obtained? Correct. Um, it was purportedly in draft form, but you understood that it was unlikely to change in any way? Correct. And it was clear that averaging was unlawful? Correct. And to your knowledge, was anything done by um, the Department of Social Services to bring an end to the robo-debt scheme in consequence of that legal advice? Not to my knowledge, no. Thank you. Ms Lumley, could you please tell the Commission your full name? Kristen Leanne Lumley. Um, between June 2015 and March 2019, were you Assistant Director, uh, Payment Integrity, Payment Conditionality, Design and Policy Branch at the Department of Social Services? Uh, yes, I was. When the issue first emerged to you in, in April 2018, you very much wanted to get external legal advice at that stage? Yes, I believe so. Was that when it first emerged or was it just bubbling about a bit more then? It was bubbling about a bit more and getting a bit more like serious. Um, I think the turning point for me was um, the Harry Carney article. Um, did it cause you great concerns that the Commonwealth might be facing substantial legal exposure given the absence of any independent legal advice? Yes, it did. And so by April 2018, your concerns were starting to become quite significant? That's, that's right. Your attempt to obtain independent legal advice at the time was declined? Yes, but again, I can't identify a person. It's just a memory that I wasn't able to progress that. But you could safely infer it would be someone superior to yourself? Correct. Okay, thank you. Months later, this witness was finally able to get approval to seek the external advice, and so she went to the legal team to get that sorted. This is when the previous witness suggested they go to Clayton Utes, who ended up giving draft advice. That the effect of that email and indeed the advice that was attached was uh, that uh, averaging was unlawful. That's correct. And, there, and was there any ambiguity in your mind about that conclusion? No, there wasn't. Uh, the, uh, indication from the law, one of the lawyers that provided the advice that they might be able to rework the advice subtly if it, this causes catastrophic issues, but that there is not a lot of room for them to do so. Yes. Uh, did you understand from that comment that um, it was, even though the advice was in draft form, the substance of the advice was never going to change? Correct. It was absolutely clear at that stage that the advice was and always would be that averaging was unlawful. Correct? In my opinion, yes. Okay. The problem was that not much happened after the Clayton Utes advice was received. This witness raised the issue over and over again, including to the head of her overall team, Alison Essex. You refer in that email to discussing the advice. See that? With Miss um, Essex? Yes. And you state that she said she would consider the issue further and speak to Nathan about it when the time was right. That's right. What did you understand the phrase when the time was right to mean? I don't know what that meant. At just that she didn't want to raise it with him now. That's, that's yeah, I, I don't know. Surely the right time was immediately. I would think so, yes. There's Phil, a current affairs story on robo-debt. I'm extremely concerned that we are sitting on the legal advice. I think you should make sure that Brenton is aware of it. It will definitely end up in the federal court. Kristen. Yes. 
Did you feel that there was inaction from those above you to act on the legal advice from Clayton Utes? Yes, I did. And you, um, were you seeking again to br bring it to their attention so that they would act on it? Yes, I was. Thank you. Ms Essex's response to Philip, CCing yourself? Yes. Dated 11th of December 2018 says, Philip Kristen, I am aware of both the legal advice and its contents. I am also aware of at least two external legal advices to the Ombudsman and DHS, which come to a different and opposite conclusion. In formulating further advice, I am having regard to the inconsistencies between the advices and the differences between the various requests for advice. I am not sitting on the advice, which could have been clarified by further discussion with me. I do not think it will definitely end up end in the federal court. I have asked Beth to make an urgent appointment for us to discuss our approach. Um, Ms Lumley, had Ms Essex, to your understanding, done anything about acting on this advice between when it was brought to her attention in August 2018 and the date of this advice, uh, email I should say? Um, I had no visibility that she had done anything with that advice. There was nothing that you were aware of no. that she'd done? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Ms Essex, would you please tell the Commission your full name? Uh, my full name is Alison Elizabeth Essex. Previously, you worked at the Department of Social Services. I did. Uh, is this right, your substantive position from mid-July 2017 until 16 January 2019 was branch manager, payment conditionality, design and policy at that uh, department? Yes. There was, <coughs> um, there was a, a strong view which had been expressed to me by Mr Williamson, as, as I said, I had heard the Secretary express that income averaging was lawful and that the Commonwealth is on solid ground in using income averaging. But that doesn't really account for AAT decisions to the contrary which are never appealed. It was, um, if I could take one step back, when the Secretary became the Secretary of the Department, she raised the level at which appeals could be approved to the group manager level, to the SES Band 2 level. Prior to that, appeals, Department of Human Services would um, provide what was called an AFAR, an advice um, regarding an appeal for, in relation to an AAT, one case that they thought was worthy of appeal. And then that decision would be made by the Director of the relevant policy section. Uh, after the secretary came, it was to uh, shifted to the band two level, and her reasoning at that time was that too many appeals were being agreed to by EL twos. Okay, and the, the secretary we're referring to is Catherine Campbell. Isn't it, it is. The questioning covered the emails the previous witness was asked about. Do you accept that you said? about the advice, words to this effect, that you will raise it with Nathan when the time is right? Yes, uh, and I'm happy to clarify what I meant by that. What did you mean? I meant after I'd read the advice. Uh, I meant after, uh, at probably my next catch-up. Um, it's a, um, a phrase I used quite commonly to mean after I had enough facts to have a sensible conversation with my manager. As it, as it happened, I had that conversation within the week. It was not my intention to delay it any further than necessary. Her boss, Nathan Williamson, a senior executive, didn't seem to be phased by the Clayton Youth's advice. When we discussed, and you may get to this later, he sent an email around the 26th of August that said, can we discuss this in our catch-up? Um, in the course of that catch-up, I told him about the Clayton Woods advice and said, we've got an advice that says it's not legal. His response to me was, it's legal, it's really clear that it's legal. By all means, if we have a robust advice, let's evaluate the situation, but it's legal. It's an email from Ms Lumley to Mr Farage, dated the 11th of December 2018. Do you see that? Familiar with the email. Do you see that in reference to a current affair story on robo-debt, Ms Lumley identifies that she was extremely concerned that we, was, we are sitting on the legal advice. Do you see that? Yes. Which is obviously in reference to the Clayton Utes advice. Yes. 
email from Mr Mafarage to yourself forwarding Ms Lumley's email? Yes. 11th of December 2018? Yep. Go to the next email in the chain. It says, I'm both aware of the... I'm aware of both the legal advice and its contents. I'm also aware of at least two external legal advices to the Ombudsman and DHS, which come to a different and opposite conclusion. What were the two external advices to which you were referring? The two that Mr Williamson had mentioned to me in the past, um, which I now think may not have been external advices, but that was my belief at the time. Did you cite them? No. Miss Essex, I suggest to you that on the 11th of December 2018, months after you received the Clayton Utes advice, you had done nothing to do anything about the advice. Uh, I don't accept that. What did you do? So I had read through the advices. I had... Um, ..worked through in my own mind to the extent that I was able, the logic uh, across the various things. I had turned my mind to which questions might need to be answered. I'd had a conversation with Mr Kemp. I had indicated that uh, a ministerial briefing should be prepared. Uh, when I came back to the job, to my substantive job, it became clear that uh, that hadn't been prepared, so I started to turn my mind to what that would look like. I had regard to the fact that I could not brief, even as a group manager, I could not brief the minister without it going through the deputy secretary and, in this case, the secretary. I had turned my mind to the level of force that the argument would need to have for that briefing to go forward. I had turned my mind, as I'd indicated earlier, to questions of authority and I had turned my mind to the best way to do that to uh, protect my staff in that process. I accept that you don't think that I did that as quickly as I could have. Well, apart from having a conversation with Mr Kemp indicating that a ministerial brief should be prepared, everything that you've described about what you'd done was simply turning your mind to various things. Up to this point, you were continually making excuses so as to not have to deal with the advice. I don't accept that. We will hear from her superiors in future videos. The final witness of the week was the Commonwealth Prosecutor in charge of prosecuting welfare fraud cases. There's a concern that people were being criminally prosecuted based on fake robo-debts. Mr Carter, can you tell the Commission your full name, please? James Edwin Carter. And your current position? I'm currently Acting Commonwealth Solicitor for Public Prosecutions in the Office of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. Over those many years, we won't specify them, but you've had close involvement in and supervision of cases relating to welfare fraud. Yes, that's the case. Mr Carter, could you very briefly, appreciating that you have set out these topics in some detail in your statement, provide us with an overview of the role of the DPP? The Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions is responsible for the prosecution federally of offences against uh, federal law and in some cases state and territory provisions, but our role is, is as a federal prosecuting agency and we prosecute based on briefs of evidence that are referred to us by referring agencies. It may be the police or they may be in, uh, departments or agencies with an investigative capability and those briefs are assessed by the CDPP in accordance with the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth. And prosecutions may then commence and the CDPP has courage of those in the courts across Australia. Mr Carter, you referred to uh, the referral of various investigative agencies. One of those historically has been Centrelink or the Department of Human Services, now Services Australia. That's correct. One of the um, positions of the CDPP in respect of the prosecution of cases of welfare fraud has long been that it would not prosecute cases on the basis of averaged uh, earnings information. Income cases, that's correct, yes. Yes. Despite this, People were prosecuted even though their debts were based on income averaging. 
the matter which is identified in your supplementary statement, uh, GB, yes. I think, it was picked up after um, charges, I think 10 in total, had been presented in the magistrate's court um, and information came from DHS that the administrative debt had been reduced substantially upon a review requested by the defendant. Yes. Um, that is, the debt went from approximately $13,000 down to approximately $200. Uh, that is one of the debts. I, I believe that's the case, yes. Um, and that, uh, as you set out, uh, led the CDPP to consider that there was no public interest in the prosecution of the debt, which was likely to remain of approximately $200. Yes. Um, but again, that was a matter which wasn't able to be identified on the material, I take it, referred to the CDPP. That's our view. Yes. The CDPP has done some orders to try and find these and correct them, but it's been very difficult because of the quality of Centrelink information. Because of this, there may be unidentified people who have been convicted of crimes based on robo-debts. And that's it for week five. Things are about to get even more interesting next episode when Alan Tudge, Christian Porter and other key witnesses make their appearance. Thank you for watching. These videos take a lot of work to put together. And if you feel like helping the channel grow, then please consider checking out my Patreon page. I'll put a link in the description.